Welcome back to the Friday edition of Forecast Lab. The North Atlantic Oscillation is in the negative territory, which is indicative of blocking, especially out there in the Atlantic. We're going to take a look at that shortly. Most of the other indicators look pretty typical this time of year. Matt and Julian Oscillation still sitting at Phase 2. The surface analysis late this afternoon showing a cold front from the St. Lawrence Valley down through the Appalachians, down towards Arkansas and Oklahoma. Some very cool air up there around Denver. Only 66 degrees this afternoon. Yesterday it was in the 50s. Pretty impressive there for July. And the dry line extending from about La Junta, Colorado, down towards Clovis and down towards the Davis Mountains. Back in here, some very warm, dry air. You can see Phoenix. That's a good litmus test for what's going on. They've got a temperature of 107 over 33. And that's pretty dry. That's typical what we have in the early summer. Tucson, very similar, 105 over 41. If we were in a monsoon pattern, we would see something like 98 over 58 or 100 over 60, which would be pretty sultry. Most of the truly sultry air, the tropical air mass located right there in the Gulf Coast region, numerous showers and storms, too many to cover really, and more of them along these frontal boundaries throughout the central U.S. and even back there in the Rockies, numerous showers and storms. Out there in the Pacific, we've got the Pacific High starting to build into California, getting that westerly gradient going, and that's a very classic summertime pattern, and that pushes the marine layer right up there to the coast. Lots of stratocumulus and stratus along the coastal regions. Let's head up north. We've got wildfire smoke in British Columbia, some showers and storms there in British Columbia on up towards almost to southeastern Alaska. Very warm afternoon up into the mid-80s in some areas. In Alaska itself, in the mainland part, 50s and 60s, they're back behind this frontal boundary, which is moving through the glacier areas. And out ahead of it, 80s, very warm afternoon. And I thought I saw a 90 degree reading earlier around Whitehorse. In northern Canada, not much going on. Little blob of cold air across the Coral Harbor to Cambridge Bay area. And we do have some warm air up there in Labrador, up close to 80 degrees. That's helping to generate these thunderstorms that you see around Shefferville down towards Quebec City. All right, let's take a look at some of these satellite imagery and put this into perspective. And there we go, some of that thunderstorm activity in Labrador. These are probably some of the only storms you could get on with no storm chasers around. Who knows? Never can tell in this day and age. But yeah, numerous cells all the way down south. And they've got quite a bit of instability down there in Maine. Let's take a look at the SPC products. Now, there are some very good tools at the SPC site. What you can do is go up to the top here, just click on this forecast tools, and that'll bring you down towards all these products right here. The one we're going to use for this afternoon is going to be this, uh, where is it right there, Mesoscale Graphics. And what we'll do is we'll click on the northeastern U.S. where we have these numerous cells going at this hour. And we'll take a look at the instability. So there's those cells right there. That's going to be under the thermodynamics menu. A good place to start is the most unstable cape. And we can see that that's hovering right around uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 throughout this entire area. But the 2,000 plus is going to be right in here, out ahead of these cells, another patch right there, and another right there. So that's going to be derived from the rapid refresh model. And there's some very good products up here you can use. A popular one when you're waiting on initiation to begin. You can use uh, either the moisture convergence or the divergence and vorticity. Now, this is not as useful at this time because the boundaries have already formed up. So a lot of the patterns are going to be distorted. But if we were to go back in time, that's going to be the 
little closer to the pre-convection hour, there's this little menu up here at the top right. That takes us back several hours, if I can get that to stop right there. There we go. And you can see some convergence coming together right there in northern Vermont and across New York. And you can also see the wind field coming together. So that shows where you have mass convergence taking place, and that is a very efficient way of breaking the cap or just getting thunderstorms going. So let's take a look down south. Yeah, we've definitely got active convection through that area, some of it along sea breezes and others along old boundaries. And this is where you have to really use that mesoscale analysis to find out where those are going to form. You can already see one boundary forming right in here. As we animate that, let me pan up so you can get a better look at that. That's going to be right under here. So if you're forecasting the next day, you're going to want to kind of keep an eye on where those boundaries end up. These mesoscale tools are not quite as useful because they just do not resolve the fine scale structure in the atmosphere. It tends to be a little bit smoothed over, but it does give you an idea where the synoptic scale forcing is and maybe some of the larger scale mesoscale forcing. So you can use this as a ballpark tool to figure out where storms are going to develop, but you really need to be looking at those satellite and radar products. And by radar, let's take a look at that area there around uh, eastern Virginia. There's the Wakefield radar this morning. That's going to be Norfolk, and that's going to be Richmond. And as we animate this, we get the cells going up. And you can see outflow developing and radiating away from these cells. So there's one boundary right there. They merge up through this region here. And where they end up, well... You have to use all of your tools, radar and satellite, and surface data to some extent. Here's an example of using that surface data. In Texas, we had the sea breeze coming up from the coast this morning. You can see that surging north into East Texas, and it's kind of died out. Not much left of it did not produce much in the way of precipitation. But earlier, let's take a look at that surface map there's what the weather map looked like about midday. And you really have to search for these details, but we do see behind the sea breeze, the winds are more out of the south. North of the sea breeze, they were a little bit more southwesterly. So that kind of differentiates the air masses. You can see 91 over 72 at Palestine, and south of that, cooler temperatures between 81 and 88 degrees. And you also want to track those through the overnight hours. So we're going back to yesterday evening. You can see cells developing out there in Wyoming and others in Kansas. And if we animate that, there we go. We can see a couple of MCSs going up, one around Colorado, another in Nebraska. And those are definitely laying down outflow boundaries. So you kind of use that as a baseline for trying to figure out where they're going to end up during the morning and afternoon hours. So you can use that data, the progression of stuff through the overnight hours, and use that as a starting baseline for what you're going to find on the smaller scale satellite and radar data. So elsewhere around the country, we've had an SPC marginal risk up there in the northeastern U.S. In the southeastern region, we've talked about those showers and storms, and that's due to two-inch precipitable water along the Gulf Coast. And inland, it's more in the range of about 1.75. Very high, but that's typical for this time of year. Also, today is the seventh anniversary of the Eureka, Kansas tornado. Produced EF2 to EF3 damage back in 2016. A hundred structures in town damaged, but fortunately no casualties from that tornado. And across the southwestern U.S., well, numerous cells throughout New Mexico up into the front range of Colorado. But in the southwestern U.S., it is hot. Got a little wildfire plume right there. Uh, I guess it's going to be around Seligman, somewhere in that area. And they do have a critical fire risk through much of northern Arizona, especially around the Grand Canyon region. So if you're up in that area, be very careful with your outdoor fires. 
or, of course, don't do them at all. Going across the pond looks pretty quiet there in Europe, but we are starting to see the heat from Turkey down towards the Middle East. Let's go back to the afternoon hours. You can see 106 in some parts of Turkey. And scrolling down into Iraq, look at that 117, 120 around Basra. And this does tend to be a very hot area. This region right here along the Tigris and Euphrates River, the cradle of civilization. And I don't know how they put up with those kinds of temperatures back thousands of years ago. Now we are looking at a major heat wave coming up for next week. Now, for those of you not familiar with this product right here, you might be looking at the oranges and reds and thinking, oh, that's where it's hot. Well, that's not exactly correct. The oranges and reds show where it's hotter than normal for that location. Likewise, the blue colors are where it's colder than normal for that location. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. You can see it's in the 90s and 100s right there. They use a green shade. And that's indicating that temperatures are a little bit on the mild side. All right, so I'm going to take you into the data for next week. So going into tomorrow, 110 around Phoenix and Tucson, also 90s in Washington. For Sunday, the heat is starting to ramp up just a little bit right here. Continued cool in Colorado, some of that cold air diffusing down into Oklahoma, and some of it working into Atlanta. Nashville and Knoxville. For Monday, we're starting to see the heat cranking up there in the southwest. There's Tuesday, 105 at Midland, 108 at Roswell, and 113 at Phoenix. Wednesday is going to be one of the hottest days, almost 110 at Roswell. Lots of 100s all the way from the California deserts, 116 there around the Salton Sea, all the way to 100 around Dallas-Fort Worth and San Antonio. And there's Thursday, and this could very well persist into the following weekend. So definitely be prepared for the heat if you're in that part of the U.S. And does look warm in some other areas of the country as well. And let's take a look at that upper level chart that we have for this evening. 200 millibars looking at pivotal weather here. And this shows us that the flow is low zonal, very meridional. Very wavy, lots of transport of heat and momentum north and south. And we also see that we've got kind of a blocky pattern out there in the Atlantic. There's a cutoff low right there, almost a cutoff high to the north, and that is a block. And if we look at that NAO gate between Iceland and Greenland and the Azores, the flow is going pretty much straight from Greenland to the Azores. There's not any crosswise flow. So that puts us in the negative range for the NAO index. And when we're in a negative NAO pattern, again, that's blocky conditions, unsettled weather in the northeastern U.S., and sometimes these Hudson Bay lows, like what we have this week. And of course, the flip side of that is the subtropical high located around the El Paso area. You can see over the next week, not very much change. The Subtropical high kind of broadens out right there across the southwestern deserts, expands and pushes that heat into Texas. And we're still looking at that Hudson Bay low up to the north. Definite blocking out there in the Atlantic, high amplitude ridge. So just not much change over the next couple weeks. All right, some of our regular viewers have probably noticed that the format has changed just a little bit. And that's because I'm trying to shake things up. I sensed that the format we've been doing has been a little bit stagnant and focused on the news. I wanted to get some of that forecasting content back into the program. So we're going to probably do the shows a little bit like what we have today from now on, at least the best that I can. I'm going to leave you with some more footage from the Texas Hill Country. Thanks to Greg for some more of this great footage taken just within the last week or so. We'll see you back here once again on Monday for the supporters and on Wednesday for everybody else. Hope you have a great weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.